Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, wherever you are in the world. I'm Dr. Jen Johnson, and I'm so excited today to have IVAPM Live with two wonderful colleagues, um, Gwen Francisco and Ann Gilson, who are going to have a frank conversation about how veterinarians and technicians can talk to each other about pain management. And I think this is gonna be wonderful to share with your staff, a wonderful to generate some great discussion. And I'm really excited to be part of this discussion today as well. Uh, so I'm not gonna speak anymore. I just thank you all for joining and I'm gonna pass this over to Gwen and Anne. Hi, uh, I'm Gwen Francisco. and. Anne and I are, are we're going to do just really brief bios so you know who we are. Um, my background is in journalism. I was a broadcast journalist for a number of years and then had a, a mid-career mid change to veterinary medicine, uh, got my tech license. And then in 2016, I was certified as a veterinary uh, pain practitioner. Um, and a very brief story that turned the way that this pain management became such a passion with me. I was blessed to work at um, one of the best hospitals, I really believe, <laughs> in Seattle. And I worked with Dr. Tim Krabbel, who um, I just adore. And we had a patient come in, an elderly lab type patient that was the dearest, sweetest thing, family loved them. But he was he was just deteriorating, and we weren't really sure what was going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And his family was almost ready to euthanize him. And Dr. Krabbel said to me, "You know, uh, let's just see what we can do with a bunch of morphine and see if we can't control his pain." And we gave him morphine. And I came in the middle of the night, gave him some more morphine. And the next morning, this old guy was up walking around and eating. And it was just this huge epiphany to me. If we can interrupt that pain cycle, if we can give that patient some comfort for a while, we can make a huge, huge difference. So here I am. Thank you, IVAPM, for even being there and supporting me and allowing me to get my um, CVPP. Um, Currently, I am focusing on education. I uh, work with fourth year vet students and we do um, both pain management, just increasing their knowledge and helping them develop their protocols. So Anne, your turn. Hey guys, so my background actually is I've been, I was a technician for a lot longer than I have been a vet. Um, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts and um, went to tech school and I worked in small animal general practice uh, for 12 years before deciding to go to vet school. Um, and to be honest, the topic of this discussion, it's not the only reason that I wanted to become a vet, but it's it did weigh in heavily because um, it's very frustrating to, you know, feel as though the animals are not getting the best care and to know that you only have, you can only do so much. Um, and especially when it came to animals being in pain, um, felt very strongly about that. Um, so that being said too, um, I want to say that some of the suggestions um, that Gwen and I have talked about and that I'll be talking about almost make it sound like I don't think that being a tech is enough and you should you should seek outside help. But the reason I'm saying that is because I know from personal experience how difficult it is as a technician to make change. And I just want to share the things that sometimes worked for me. Because to me, if one of my technicians came to me and said an animal was in pain, of course I would listen to that and, and go over and have a conversation about it. But I know that's not happening everywhere. So that's kind of why we're here today to talk about it. So I never mean any disrespect. I have the utmost respect for technicians and veterinary medicine is nothing without veterinary technicians. But um, I just want to, for better or worse, explain the tactics that I've seen work before. Um, so I'm currently in Arizona. Um, I work at a small animal general practice um, and they're very supportive of how I want to practice medicine, which I am very grateful for. Okay, I'll kick it to Gwen and we'll start, we'll start. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we um, mostly thank you, Anne, for doing a lot of the hard work on this. Came up with some examples, real life examples. She talked to real 
um, technicians who are working in surgery every day. And we're going to talk briefly, I'll just briefly explain the situation and then both of us kind of chime in. What can we do about this? So this one, um, forgive me, I'm kind of reading here, a small animal technician works in a general practice and she is primarily the surgical technician. She monitors anesthesia and also provides the post-op care. So she's doing the post-op checks and vitals and she finds that one of the patients she's responsible for, this is a husky puppy who was spayed that day, is uncomfortable. She's The puppy is whining, um, reacting to a surgical site palpation. She's unable to settle down or to rest at all. She assesses the vitals and she truly believes this patient is in pain. So she goes back to the surgical veterinarian and asks for additional pain medication. And the response she gets, um, and again, these are real life situations, is the veterinarian response that this particular breed, this is a husky again, is known for being a baby and knowing for being dramatic and refuses to provide any additional pain relief. So again, Anne and I both kind of came at this, what could we do? Uh, what could I do as a technician? What could she, just her suggestions uh, as, a, as a clinician um, and her experience as a technician, certainly. So some of the things I thought of um, for the technician to be very specific, to say, I palpated the surgical side. Um, I, you know, I determined this is not dysphoria. I did this and this and this. And more, the more specific you are with the clinician, that could help. Um, the breed assumption is a different argument, and you can certainly con uh, con challenge that. Um, if a puppy is a, a husky or whatever and is still reacting and crying when you palpate a, the incision site, you know, that has nothing to do with the breed. But you can, and we all need to be knowledgeable about breeds. We can challenge it with that knowledge. Um, be very, very specific about the parameters you find that as a technician that determines in your uh, mind that this is a painful patient, real specific. Um, go back and think about the total surgical protocol. I mean, for instance, if you gave hydro and it's now four hours later, you know that there's not much of anything left on board. So those kinds of things might help jar. Just let's go over the whole protocol and determine, well, maybe, you know, maybe we're going to need a little more of this or this. Um, and then I would, um, and depending on your relationship with the doctor, but I, I would be really um, clear and say, ask the doctor, what specific information do you need? What would convince you that this patient is in pain? How, let's have a talk about that. And you tell me what you need. Those are my ideas. So go ahead and you chime in. Okay, I agree with everything that you just said. Um, and it's so dicey to approach without, you know, accusing to make it not seem to the doctor like you're accusing them, um, which again, I don't feel like any doctor should react that way, especially in a situation about animal uh, pain or patient patient comfort, but that does happen. Um, so coming at it from like one idea I had was there's the, I believe it's the Colorado pain scale. And there's a couple others that have been tested and proven by good institutions. Um, and you could take that and say, come from at it like a, like, Hey, I want to learn too. let's go examine this patient together with the scale and go through it together. Um, the breed thing is a whole other concern um, because I don't really know what that means that this breed is a baby after it was paid. Um, but uh, I think that just coming at it from like, let's learn about this together or let's go look at this together um, in a way that's not challenging. And again, that's so frustrating because you should be listened to as a technician, but I think that there's sometimes some egos involved, if I'm being honest, and um, coming at it from like a, let's do this together, or you show me why you think this animal's not in pain using this information, and then maybe you can get the person to come around. But um, yeah, I mean, Gwen is absolutely right. All of those things are um, appropriate and valid. Yeah. And I want to add a couple of things. A lot of my ideas are putting a lot of the work on the technician. And, and I get that. 
Um, and But that's reality. That's the way things are right now. And the other point I want to make for sure is um, to always respect the, as a technician, I, I always told myself, hey, I may not agree with this clinician, but I'm going to respect that he or she has the license. He or she has um, the response, bottom line responsibility for this patient. Uh, so doesn't mean I'm not going to argue with him, but I totally need to respect that license and what that means to the doctor. So, okay. Do you, do you want to go ahead with number two? Sounds good. Okay. Number two, a <clears throat> small animal technician um, who is, again, working in a general practice setting. Um, she is primarily the technician responsible for monitoring anesthesia. She works with a veterinarian whose anesthesia pre-med protocol is Oh God, almost always butorphanol with ACE plus or minus atropine, uh, regardless of the procedure. I just died a little inside. Uh, induction is with propofol. There's no locals, there's no NSAIDs. Um, the technician is concerned. Yep, this is an inappropriate protocol for many procedures, especially spays. And the doctor she is working with has previously reacted very poorly to being challenged by techs. Okay, Gwen, what do you think? Well, um... Yeah, I I kind of I kind of died inside and screamed a lot for most of these. So, all right, we'll start with this is almost a human resources problem. So, if you're lucky enough to work in a practice with a good practice manager, that would be a good place to start. Say, you know, let's work this out. Um, other options are the tech could suggest a very specific protocol. And again, this requires some research, some knowledge, and training on the technician's part but give the doctor some options. I think this protocol might work a little better. You know, to, let's remember that butorphanol, we're lucky if it's on board for an hour. Um, and clearly state these, these are the benefits to the patient, both in recovery and when it goes home. And I wanna stress that many times throughout here. You, Client satisfaction is pretty darn important, and a and a patient that goes home and is comfortable, instead of crying all night, you get some ha some happy clients that way, and they'll ask for the doctor when they come back. Uh, another idea would be, uh, given the personality of this clinician, um, is to get support from another surgeon in the practice and say, "Can we go talk to this doctor together?" Can you help me to explain, or even you explain, your licensed clinician, explain why it might be important, assuming, of course, you can get agreement with that person and have a discussion doctor to doctor that might be more effective. And you know, this again, it's not ideal, but if we're remembering a bottom line is we want what's best for our patient. The other thing I learned this, of course, um, the hard way always, um, that you, sometimes you just have to go slow don't, you just can't do everything you want right away. So um, maybe make one or two changes at a time. And when that proves to be successful, then move on. Well, of course, you're going to want to use, locals are such an easy thing to teach people and they're so safe. Maybe start with that, or move on to non-steroidals, whatever you want to do. And that's it for me. Okay, so when Gwen had come back to me with this example, talking about um, getting support from another doctor, again, so frustrating that you are not listened to just by virtue of being uh, an employee, an experienced and knowledgeable technician. That being said, I know from very personal experience, I think there's at least one person listening tonight who has experienced this with me. Um, when I was a technician and we were having a lot of trouble um, getting some changes made um, that really needed to happen. We, um, it was actually an IVPM local. She was a CVPP at a local hospital and she was a doctor, she was a vet. Um, we had her come in and say basically what we had been saying for a very long time, but coming from her, from another doctor, it was then taken on. And like, I think this is true for all of us who want to help the animals. Like. I don't want the, I don't care if I get the credit for making the change. I just want the change to happen. So it's not okay that that's a better way to do it, but it's effective. And if it gets the animals what they need at the end of the day, then that's really all that matters. Um, and Gwen's point about being patient is so, so true and so, so hard, but 
even if you start to get someone to make some changes, that's hard for everybody. Like that's hard for me. It, like changes to your routine and what you're used to and comfortable with is hard. It's going to be a marathon and not a sprint for sure. Um, so not getting frustrated when there isn't a whole new protocol starting tomorrow is important. Um, but yeah, that's a one like a really important point that I just want to make is I know from experience that if you get a, someone with a DVM to say what you have been saying, it gets sometimes gets taken more seriously and it's not okay, but it does get you what you need. Just sharing from personal experience. Yeah, we live in the real world. So, and we want to help our patients. So, okay, so we'll move on to the next one. And I got to say, I, I'm so grateful to be doing this with you, Anne, because of your d dual background. And um, anyway, this is just the bottom line is among, of course, we're trying to help our patients. We're also trying to help our technicians and keep them in the field. And this is the kind of thing that, that I hope will help. All right, so we have a similar um, scenario to the one that, um, um, oh dear, this is an awful one. <gasps> Small animal technician, she's doing surgeries with the, in this practice. Uh, she works in a practice with the dreaded Omnicell. If you don't know what that is, it's a, a dispensing cabinet for uh, dispensing control drugs. And it's very, very specific of who and how those individuals can get into this cabinet. It's maybe a code, maybe a thumbprint, whatever. Um, but <clears throat> they they're they're um they're tough to work with. I have done this. Okay. In this situation, only the veterinarian has access to this and can open and therefore get out the control drugs. So when a patient um is painful intraoperatively and what do they usually do? They kind of start looking like they're going to jump off the table. One of the most terrifying things for a, a, a surgery tech. But they can't get out the opioids. They can't get out um, any kind of immediate pain relief. So they draw up extra propofol and they bolus the propofol. That's the that's their practice. Um, yeah, this this one's pretty scary. Um, having done many, 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 many surgical procedures as the uh, surgery tech. Uh, my job is to keep that patient on the table, comfortable, and of course, breathing and blood pressure and so on. And if I had to bolus a bunch of propofol, what, you know, let's just think about it. What's going to happen? Respiratory depression, maybe apnea, maybe all the way to cyanosis, myocardial depression, possibly arrhythmia, certainly hypotension. Uh, and and quite possibly delayed recovery. All of these are not what you want in surgery. The other thing to think about is that propofol, if you're going to uh, administer it safely, you're going to do it slowly. You're going to titrate it slowly. Well, if your patient's ready to jump off the table, um, you know, it's kind of hard to do that as slow as you should. You're also likely to turn up that ISO, yet another thing, the worst thing you, you can do for your patient. So those, again, a discussion with the, with the um, practice owner or whoever is in charge of, of this Omnicell saying, hey, this is what we're having to do to come up with a better answer. Um, the, and, and maybe talking to, again, the practice manager or, or owner, whatever, what why is what is your the reason for your choice of only allowing this one individual who is in surgery and therefore can't access it? What's the pro, why is that choice being made? It might be um, a legal requirement in that state. It might be uh, that they want uh, they only want individuals with a certain level of training. Just get these questions answered. Get the rationale behind it to begin with and then come up with some ideas of how can we uh, add to the individuals who can get at this, this um, Omnicell, um, what, or what, what safety protocols could we put in? Um, what, you know, what could we do to make it better for you, um, practice owner? And uh, maybe little things sometimes if and this should be protocol anyway i guess but sometimes small things like okay i will always always show exactly what i'm going to give to the patient double check with the surgeon before i get it 
I mean, sometimes those small things really see, seem to help. Um, and, and then just get a, a kind of a basic bottom line answer. What would you need to make you comfortable, practice owner, to let a technician have access to this, uh, this dispensing device? And that's that's the best I can think of, right? Because it's a, it's a tough one. It's a really tough one. I hate those things, frankly. I had to, we had them. And it was a real battle to get, to decide who can get in, who can't. And technicians absolutely were allowed access to them in my practice, which I sure appreciate now hearing this story. So what do you think, Ann? You actually made a good point uh, when you uh, you and I talked this about this originally, and you mentioned the legal requirements. Um, and in, to be full disclosure, I actually don't know if that's a legal requirement in some states, but it's not where you are and it's not where I am. Um, so if that's part of the issue, then you may have a separate problem in your state. But um, for the states, not a legal requirement to be a doctor to have access. I would almost argue that it is unsafe to only allow the doctor um, to have access. I mean, I'm thinking about like days when I've been the only doctor in the building and I'm in surgery. If I'm elbow deep in a spay and I need something or somebody needs something and I literally can't go get it, that seems dangerous to me almost. Um, so I guess that would almost be a reason in itself um, that, and I'm not really sure where the hangup is. Like I understand not giving everyone access, um, Omnicell, I mean, it knows exactly who is removing what um, and kind of is almost a better log than just a regular drug box. Um, it almost seems a little bit safer to me to ask someone to have access to that than a regular drug box. Um, and if the issue is, you know, just being turned that the technician might not draw up the right amount or the right concentration, um, I like a double check system is quick, easy, and would be effective. And that's never a bad idea. Like doctors make mistakes too. Doctors should also sometimes double check. I think that that a double check system would um, it just make sense in general and maybe would make the practice owner or the manager feel more comfortable. Um, I think that the, that was the first thing I thought of when um, Gwen responded to me with this question was, I, as a veterinarian, I would feel very unsafe being the only person in the building with access to drugs because sometimes I might be in a situation where I can't get them and I need them. Um, and that's a little bit frightening to me. So I, I think that that in itself would be a good argument. All right, your turn. Okay. Uh, all right, so we're back in small animal GP. <laughs> um, Small Animal GP Tech notices that one particular veterinarian never addresses arthritis in patients. Asked, the veteran responds that it is hard to get people to admit their pet and pain. And in her experience, people don't want to spend money on medication or ancillary services like acupuncture, so she just doesn't bother bringing anymore. Fantastic. Okay. Isn't this appalling? Oh, this is where I wanted to scream. This one I really wanted to scream. Um, can, did you want to go first or can I jump in or? Oh, you're good. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I guess the first thing, it is tough to convince clients that their patient has arthritis. It is. They don't, we all know the, the old stories. Oh, he's just getting old. Oh yeah. He doesn't eat as much, but that's because he's old. Um, so I learned something and along with the 8 million other things I learned from the incredibly smart Dr. Tammy Grubb, who I also adore. Uh, and she said to talk to your patients, uh, or excuse me, to your clients about their pet. When you talk to them about OA, you don't lead with they have arthritis, rather you lead with your, your puppy, your kitty, whatever is in pain. And I want to do something about that pain. I want to alleviate that pain because it's just, it's hard on them. And then you can go into, it's because due to arthritis and I've diagnosed it for this and this reason. Um, so you can educate them certainly, but lead with pain. Nobody wants their, their um, beloved pet to be in pain. Um, so some more specific ideas of what a technician can do. Again, I'm putting a lot of this, the onus on the technician. Um, create a talk with owner kind of thing. And it could be <clears throat> certainly educational, uh, 
the technician would go in and and do this little talk that frees up the doctor again gives you more doctor time uh on just on osteoarthritis in our our patients and it doesn't take much to learn enough about this disease to know that it affects depending on who you talk to up to 80 percent of our patients so it's definitely worth learning about um you can in this talk you could there are if if cost is a concern and that's a absolutely valid concern um you can offer there's things you could do at home there's exercise there's range of motion exercises there's just plain walks there's a massage you can do at home none of that costs anything you can um ways they can alter their uh, environment to make the pet more comfortable um, and also, I, I love some of these tools that are available. Um, Zoetis has what's called an OA checklist, and the owner fills it out. And it's just extremely helpful to demonstrate to the owner what's actually going on, to convince the owner, yep, there's arthritis, and yep, my patient, my pet's uncomfortable. Um, there's videos. Uh, also, Zoetis has this great video you can put in your um, exam room or in the in the waiting room, um, but painful kitties. And one, it's a cartoon thing. One has arthritis, one is young and happy. And it, it, again, just a dark, really super good educational tool. They're all free. You can get them from a variety of sources. Um, and if your vet, you, your clinician you're working with truly believes that osteoarthritis is not painful, or if they don't really understand this is a progressive disease, this is not going to get better, this is only going to progress unless we do something, then again, you can ask your practice owner or somebody else for some in-house, maybe lunch and learn type things from, again, a licensed clinician who is able to talk about OA in a way that everybody's going to understand it, um, and to to bring home the point that a huge number of our patients either have it or in the initial stages are developing it. These are the risk factors for it. Weight loss, of course, is a big one. Previous injury, that sort of thing. Look, for, Just be aware of those when you're coming up with your differentials. And all of that can be um, worked into this talk. And another really important element of this is our job. All of us, our job is to bring our patients best quality of life we can. And quality of quality of life clearly is, is hindered if the patient is in pain and we're choosing not to treat it, or in this case, not even to bringing it up. Your turn. Okay, so there were two things um, that you just, I think, are amazing really well. Um, one being, and it's so unfortunate, you're, the technician were to offer to put together like, um, uh, like a packet or a, a talk for the clients, things that don't put more work or worse on the vet are often smiled upon. Um, mm -hmm. And it kind of sounds like, um, and understandably, it's extremely difficult to talk to people about arthritis sometimes or like, He's limping, but I don't think he's in pain, um, that whole deal. So it's frustrating and I get it. Um, but uh, I think if someone were to put the, because I feel like a lot of veterinarians know that it's painful. They're just exhausted of having this argument with clients day in and day out. Mm -hmm. um, if you made something easy for them to go forward and give, and again, you are right. This is putting pressure and um, on the technician in a very inappropriate way, but it's the reality of some people's lives, I think. Um, but I do think that would help because I think things, situations where you make the vet's life e easier is often is often more accepted for better or worse. Um, and the idea of having someone come in and give a lunch and learn, it's, again, I keep reiterating how unfair this is because I truly do think it's unfair, but a lot of these veterinarians who are saying things like what we're talking about here are going to listen more to another veterinarian. So it can even be like, like a product placement type thing when, when Zoetis will send someone in to talk to you about um, their new drug or um, just arthritis in general. I don't know why it's like this, but it seems like when it's not, because I do think sometimes it, not appropriately veterinarians feel 
challenged by technicians that are questioning certain things. Um, and that's not really appropriate because that's not how we work together together to, and make the animal's life better. Um, but it happens, this reality. Um, and for some reason, someone from the outside coming in and saying it, particularly if they're a doctor, works. And I know this from experience. Um, so I, for it's not fair, but it does work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm going to put a plug here for a book. If you, anyone hasn't read it, please, please do. It's a quick and easy read, brilliant writer. It's called Checklist Manifesto. I mean, maybe a lot of you have heard of it. I can't think of the author. He is a human. Uh, yes, he is human, of course. He works in human medicine as a surgeon um, and absolutely brilliant man, phenomenal writer. And the whole point of the book is working as a team. Everything, the checklist is, yeah, everything should be checked. You go into surgery, we automatically do it. They literally have checklists. But <clears throat> it the book emphasizes how much better medicine can be if you work at a, as a team. You take the skills and talents that everybody has, use them to the best of their ability. Um, it, it improves patient care. It, it improves everything. And Sometimes you think, you know, that that's it. We put a lot on the clinician. Again, it's their license and it's their bottom line responsibility. But if the clinician surgeon truly believes I can rely on this individual to make sure my patient's um, parameters are good in surgery, you can do your job. Your job is to slice and dice and repair and, you know, that and that's a lot of that's a hard job you should focus on it not worry about the other the other parts of keeping the patient comfortable and at a deep enough anesthetic plane so again it's uh, the teamwork is the importance of this book it's again it's called checklist manifesto marvelous book so okay are we uh, your turn are you did you did i already say too much or did you are you done <laughs> No, 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 you're good. Um, okay. So that's okay. really helpful. Suggestions were great. Um, and I really, I really think that both the um, putting together something, again, we're asking the techs to do a lot of work that really shouldn't be their responsibility, but it, it's mm -hmm. effective. What you're talking about works. Um, mm -hmm. It works. And it does, it brings certainly job satisfaction to the technician too, even with all that additional work that you know you've made a positive difference in your patient patient's life. So, okay, the next one is um, small animal tech work uh, in a general practice, um, works with a veterinarian who refuses to send home pain medication post-operatively. And I'll, I have to add, this was an example given in 2022. And the reason this doctor will not send home any pain meds is because, quote, she doesn't want them moving around too much. If they're painful, they won't be too active. They won't bust open their incision, et cetera. We've all heard these stories. This is um, really, really super old school. Um, so uh, again, I'm putting the onus on the technician, uh, but it's a lot of it is education. If you can gather in there, because there's a billion of them, peer-reviewed studies, research, et cetera, that debunk that keep them still. Um, keep them painful and still that whole theory. You can get a lot of information that debunks that. You can offer it to the doctor. And again, that's not easy. You do the best you can with talking with someone because you're challenging their ways of practice. Uh, again, I'm going to say recruit another veterinarian that is knowledgeable on post-op, um, the, the, the value and the need for post-op payments. Um, to talk with that clinician, um, you might want to start with, as a technician again, you might want to start with uh, make one change. In this case, uh, I would start with non-steroidals and use all, all the respected resources you can come up with. Vin, uh, Wasaba, there's a lot of them out there that are highly respected that would help convince the, the, the surgeon that, yep, we do need to send this home and then add, add additional drugs if possible um, as you go along very slowly. 
Okay. I agree. Again, the tried and true, but unfair, um, you know, getting someone to come in and give a talk is useful. It is truly appalling that this uh, example is from 2022. Um, and this is a really tough call, which I would understand, but I almost like given what we know in 2022, this is so inappropriate that it would almost be worth, I think, bringing up to management. Um, uh, and then that would be a them problem, which it kind of should be in the first place. It shouldn't be on the technician to be making all these changes and pointing out all these issues. But this is like so concerning to me that this is happening in 2022. Um, but I agree that I think you'd, if I'm guessing from reading this, and this might not be fair, but this is probably an older vet because um, this is an old school kind of school of thought. Um, you know, I would definitely recruit some help on that, um, whether it be another veterinarian or whether it be, I, I would honestly think that if this was me as a technician, I would possibly go to management about this. This is very frightening that this is happening. Um, but again, these are all things that are easy to say from the outside. It's a little frustrating, but um, I think that especially if someone still believes this in 2022, I think you're going to need reinforcements for this. Mm -hmm. so let me ask you a question. If you were, um, if this situation, but just take anything, um, and your your technician came up to you, and um, let's see, let's go back here. Um, and that individual said, well, let's let's start moving slowly. Let's start with non-steroidals. And here's all the information I have about non-steroidals. Would that would you feel offended? Would you feel um, you know, super cautious? And um how do you how would you, I mean, and not you as a technician, former technician, but maybe more as a doctor who is having your protocol challenged? I would not be upset. I think we're all like supposed to be on the same team here and kind of working mm -hmm. toward goals. And I have, I have one really sweet technician um, who I can't remember what procedure I was doing. Um, and I had forgotten, I think it might've been a dental and I thought I had blocked all parts of the mouth and I had it. And she just like very politely, like got it ready and nudged me for it. And was like, you forgot to do this. And she was all embarrassed that she had to tell me, but like, come to me, tell me things. Mm -hmm. That's the only way to get better. And we're, it's not being done in the situations that we're discussing. It's not being done to be confrontational or aggressive. It's being done because everybody wants the best for the animal at the end of the day. Um, I, if I'm being honest as a human, just as a person, I think if someone came and they were super aggressive about it, um, and, you know, came at me hard and very accusatory, as a person, your instinct is not to accept that information. So I think that's really important. Like you're justified to be angry, but if I think if I'm being honest, if someone came at me like hard and aggressive, I wouldn't immediately be on board. It, I think that that's just part of being a person. Um, but part of why this talk is hard for me is because it's hard for me to understand why a doctor would not listen to these things. Um, but I, I, I mean, we've all seen it. And if we've all been in the field long enough, we've all seen it. Um, so to me, if someone came up to me and just said, hey, I read about this and I, what do you think about that? I would be like, that's awesome. That's great. Then I've learned something today, maybe. Um, but I do think that just life tip that going into it calmly and as like a partnership type conversation is going to go a long way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about the argument that, hey, we're all mammals, and if somebody cut you in your tummy and your abdomen, is that being too in your face kind of snarky? Or... I mean, I guess it depends on, like, it wouldn't bother me, but I can think of colleagues that that would bother, but it's a valid point. <sighs> This feels a little bit passive aggressive too, but you could also word it like almost like you're asked, like you're inquiring, even though you're in your mind, you're doing what you just said. You could be like, well, how is that different than if I were to get a hysterectomy and I would be on a morphine drip? Like, 
as in like, tell me how that's different. And then there's a conversation about it. And mm -hmm. you may or may not like the answer, but it might be better accepted to people who are already on guard to being questioned. Yeah, that that is brilliant. I really like that. Yeah, that's that's working with the reality of human beings and working as a team. So yeah, I really, I really like that. Um, did we, did you want, did you have anything more to, to add about this clinician who wants to keep them painful? No, this is <laughs> just, <quiet>. so, <laughs> this is just horrifying. Um, I mean, I think you're right. This one is actually, um, this one's tough. Um, especially that it's happening in, um, and that you definitely need someone who is 2022 on this one. Okay, so there were a couple more um, that uh, actually were personal experiences I had. And, uh, you know, again, do you want to take it or how do you want to sure. do six uh, and seven? Who, um, that Gwen had, um, it sounds like in your personal life or someone mm -hmm. you know. So um, it's a dual. So one is um, a technician in small animal practice questions why patients frequent in the middle of surgery, forcing the text to bolus a drug or turn up the ISO. He, she suggests that the patients may be in pain and offers ideas for enhanced, enhanced pain protocol, but the surgeon says that he's used his protocol for you. No one's died of pain yet. Awesome. Um, or a tech has just completed an accredited program on small animal pain management, and they go to the medical director and argue that the practice's pain protocol should be expanded to procedures such as dentals uh, with extractions, neuters, blocked cats, pancreatitis, yes. Um, and the vet responds, oh, oh, it's just a blank neuter or dental. Okay, Gwen, what do you think? Um... I'd like to eliminate the word just from everybody's vocabulary, right? You know, it's number one. Yeah, these are things that actually did happen uh, to me. Um, and it's, yeah, it's tough. So we're back again to education. I needed to educate them. And I did. I did consistently. Um, there's also the cost factor. Is the, uh, the again the clinic owner or the or the the clinician worried about extra cost? Again, it's information knowledge. There's a lot of data out there that <clears throat> the cost benefit of providing appropriate pain management. Let's go back again to happy clients, happy patients at home, happy clients come back to your clinic. Um, there's. Uh, a lot of data from things like, well, VIN, certainly, um, AHA, Wasaba, that, uh, again, you can get that information. I'm going to put a plug in here for IVAPM. You can get speakers from IVAPM to come into your clinic, and uh, I love to do that. I, I obviously love to yammer, so I did that a lot. Um, and again, I guess just focus on that, on that uh, happy patients and happy clients, when especially when they go home. Um, I want to hear what you have to say, and then this kind of leads into the other element we wanted to talk about of, of the uh, concern with the technicians burnout, technicians leaving the field, because I'm asking them to do a lot more work for, for their patients to be happy and, and painless. Um, so go ahead, you give your response to these two, and, and I'll, then we can kind of move on to that. Okay, sounds good. Um, <clears throat> so one thing that stood out with me about this particular um, example is the, the part where you talk about like yourself or whoever has just completed a program that has given you special accreditation in a particular aspect of veterinary medicine. Um, and oh gosh, it, like, I mean, if you're I feel like it would be reasonable and a vet might on board if you were to go and be like, I, I really hope everyone is doing dental blocks, but anyway, um, to go and say, hey, I learned this. Do you mind if we try it? Um, sometimes because you've had that special uh, certification that makes them a little bit more open to it. Um, it should, I, again, I, I'm a broken record. It shouldn't be this way, but it, sometimes it is. Um, 
again, getting an, like a, an IVPM speaker is huge. Um, and you make a point too, local blocks are so cheap, so cheap. There is not to be using them for everything. Um, they do not cost a lot of money uh, and they make a big difference in my personal opinion. Um, the, the other thing too is um, a lot of our patients can be stoic, but I feel like hmm. blocked cats and pancreatitis patients are not. So I would utilize them to show the clinician, like, you cannot tell me that this cat that cannot urinate is not uncomfortable. Like they, and they usually are loud and proud about it more so than some other animals are. Um, and I think that's to our detriment too. Sometimes that these animals are so stoic. I'm like, can you please help you <laughs> that you're uncomfortable? Um, I, I think that taking any opportunity that you have, oh, pain to the practitioner would be useful. I cannot fathom why anyone would not be using blocks. Um, but you're like, the cost thing is huge. It doesn't cost a lot of money. Um, it's arguably one of the best tools we have at a really low cost. So, um, and it, at least in where I have worked, um, and I don't know if there's a lot that depends on the state, but in where I've been, technicians can do most local blocks, like they can perform them. Um, so that could be a, like a training thing to get the techs more engaged and then everyone knows how to do it. And it would just, could be an education thing and a learning thing. And I can't think of any reason why someone would say no to this, um, especially with all of, of the factors it's can only help for the most part. They can only help. They don't really hurt. They're cheap. Um, and then it could be a way of getting like the other technicians engaged. If we got everybody on board with how to do them and it, it gives them some, another tool to have, um, to me, that seems reasonable. So I would hope that that would be reasonable to other veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And that's really very perfectly leads into um, the whole discussion, a whole different discussion, why technicians are leaving the field, why they're getting burnout or just choosing to leave. <clears throat> and so, of course, we have a technician shortage. There's, there have been a, um, a few survey type things uh, done with technicians. Why do you leave the field? And of course, two big things, um, both money and responsibility. And amazingly, for most of the studies I've seen or, or surveys I've seen, the number one reason is uh, because I'm not, I as a technician, I'm not given responsibility. I'm not given um, the uh, the ability to do to utilize my skills and do the things I can do and put my education to into the practice. Uh, so the uh, one one of the things I, I did uh, do a little bit of research on um, and Jen, thank you. She sent me an article. It was published in uh, Vin News. And this was a couple uh, 2021. So it was a couple, almost yeah, a couple of years ago. Um, and the, this is an article about, is veterinary medicine ready for a mid-level practitioner? And that's the, in human medicine, it's a nurse practitioner, the physician's assistant. Is veterinary medicine ready for a similar type of, of position? And technicians who want to advance their career, this is a perfect, perfect opportunity. Um, but, but there's a lot of, of pushback for this. Uh, this, I, I'm going to read just a quick quote from this first article about this mid-level practitioner driven by issues such as underutilization, poor pay, lack of respect, and few opportunities for career advancement. Technicians have among the highest turnover rates of any healthcare occupation. This is a survey by AVMA. And let me tell you, those three things, underutilization, poor pay, lack of respect, four things, and few opportunities for career advancement is why I am not working as a surgical technician anymore. I'm out doing education. That just utilizes what I can do so much better. Um, the, the, there's a, certainly, this is not a quick and easy thing. Um, pr state practice acts would probably almost certainly have to be revised. The educational programs and the certification of those programs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but again, we've got another argument. Hey, that's this would give uh, technicians the ability to do a lot of the things that vets have to do now that can easily be done by a technician uh, freeing up vet time. 
um, possibly lowering the total cost of veterinary care for, for each client. Um, but, but, okay, we'll go back to the second article here. This is, um, uh, 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 let's see, American um, Veterinary Medicine Colleges, Association of Veterinary Medicine Colleges. And they did a survey about this mid-level practitioner and asked, um, survey was sent to technicians, vet assistants, and veterinary staff, not to, to doctors, uh, and said if there was a graduate nursery, uh, veterinary nursing program that uh, could achieve, where you could achieve uh, the title they gave it was Advanced Practice Registered Veterinary Nurse. What would you think? Would you do that? And there was huge enthusiastic response. They got a 703 responses back, 80% in favor of this. So then we move on to the bad news part. Just last month, the AVA, AVMA House of Delegates met. They talked about this. And the end result of that meeting was, this is another quote from the meeting, uh, the idea of mid-level practitioner was rejected in favor of better support, better engagement of credential veterinary technicians. Um, I could just rant for quite a while on this. Uh, more of the same is not gonna fix the problem. And it's a serious concern that we are losing some of the very, very best technicians. Um, and it's hardship for doctors, it's a hardship for everybody. So tell me what you think of this mid-level practitioner and how, how can that become more accepted in veterinary medicine? I'm wondering if it's gonna be more accepted as time goes on, because I think a lot of the kind of old school vets are, their minds are like exploding thinking about this. Um, it's a big difference, it's a big change. To be perfectly honest, at least where I am, and I think this is most places, that would be amazing if I could have one of these people in my practice. We are, we don't have enough of anybody in the hospital, including doctors. Um, so to have um, one of these advanced nurses would be amazing. It would be helpful for me, for the techs. I'm not sure, I looked it up myself and no one's really saying exactly why they're against it. I don't know if there's concern about um, like the DVM being, less of a big deal if someone, I mean, this is something that happens in human medicine, like there's MDs and then there's nurse practitioners, PAs, everybody seems to be doing okay. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, and I don't know how we fix this and I don't know if we do, but a bigger problem too is I support this platform, but I also think that we need to start paying veterinary technicians a livable wage and treating them with respect. You should not feel be, be made to feel guilty for taking a lunch or a vacation. Um, mm -hmm. You are, your opinions should be listened to the other people that you work with. You should be able to afford rent and gas. Like I don't, it's, it's unfathomable to me why we are all surprised that we're losing so many technicians when I feel like they're not being always treated appropriately. And they're not being like, at the end of the day, if you're not making enough money to survive, you can't do this. Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that some people's point was, well, we need to start small. And I think that we need to look at the whole picture at this point, because none of it's really working and we're all starting to feel it. Um, we are down several technicians where I am and there's no one to hire. There, there, there's nobody. And it's a little frightening because um, I think people realize as they lose technicians, how much they need technicians. Um, we can't do anything without technicians. So I think that the whole system needs to be looked at. And we're all kind of realizing now that we're in trouble, uh, but I don't know that anyone is doing anything about it. That's my two cents is I, I support this wholeheartedly. I think that I, if I could get one of the, in my practice right now, that would really change things for me. It would be awesome. Um, but I do also think that some, someone is gonna have to address the fact that we need to take better care of our techs. Do you um, have, a, have any thoughts on what would be the, the best venue, avenue, whatever, to try to make these changes? Where would a person who supports this start? It's In theory, I think you would start at your state board. Um, but, well, yeah, I think every state has a tech board as well. I would mm -hmm. probably start there because I think 
I have a feeling that that would be a more, um, get a more favorable response there um, if you started with the tech board and then getting support that way and then moving on to talk to the vet board. And, you know, at some point we probably all need to have a conversation about like, what exactly is it about this that you don't like or don't want? Um, Cause I feel like no one's really saying, I, I couldn't really get a good read on what people are actually concerned about. Um, but I think that's what, where I would start is with the local um, technician board and then go from there, um, especially mm -hmm. if you have a good one. Yeah, okay. I think we're uh, close to out of time. Um, Jen, I was just gonna check if we had any other questions or comments yeah. or anything. I think I think that um, you guys gave everybody such a, a lot to think about. The big question that I, that I think that because this last topic is a, for me, a really hot button topic and the question that, that I'm getting um, on the Facebook side is, and it's more of a statement than a question. We know exactly why most people aren't against this advanced nursing degree. It's because, let me ask both of you, do you work in practices that have non-certified technicians that they call technicians? Oh, don't even get me. <laughs> okay, of so, of so <laughs> being very frank, if you, if the, if, if we cannot protect the technician license and pay them to be a licensed technician, why in the world should we be promoting a degree above that if we can't even if we can't even protect our credentialed technicians who are basically um, as um, educated? And and that's a great question. And why would you want a an advanced nursing? if you can even protect them or pay them more or or mm -hmm. have them only be able to do the procedures as opposed to having um, non-certified techs, they should, you know, the, the assistants doing them with on the right. job training. Right, right. And so you know, what's your feeling about that, you guys? Um, okay, number one, of course, uh, and, and non-licensed individual who calls him or herself a technician is like saying, I'm a little bit pregnant. You either are or you aren't, you know? And so, okay, that, that just simply shouldn't be allowed in Washington state. The law is pretty specific. <clears throat> and if you follow the law, there are very specific things only a technician can do. And if you have an unlicensed person doing them, you know, technically you're violating the law. So, Ah, uh, yeah, that's, I, I can't tell you the number of, again, really good techs I've talked to, and they really say they really like working in with uh, dentals, and I'll say, oh, you should get certified in dentistry, you know, you're really good at this, and the inevitably, I get the same response, well, why should I, I'm not going to get paid more, and I'm probably not going to be given any more responsibility, so there you go, it's exactly what you said, Jen, and um, yeah. I don't, that's I don't have an answer for that one uh, beyond what I would really like is to hear someone with the, the business knowledge say um, this is how it would impact the bottom line this is what it would cost this is a this is how a you know cost benefit analysis go ahead Ann. I mean I agree I think that kind of circles back to the point that we have a root problem here um, that starts at the very bottom. Um, I, I, we are, and I felt this a little bit too when I was a technician, I was credentialed, um, but there's not, you know, you almost hit like a pay cap um, mm -hmm. at, depending on what hospital you're at. Um, and a lot of times it's not a livable wage. Um, and then we are frustrated and because we can't find good experienced help, but we're not doing anything to keep those people in the field, I think. Um, they're in, I, so that is, I think, a root problem. And that makes sense as to what that person's comment on Facebook was that um, why keep going forward when we haven't even handled what we have at the start, which is true. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we've all known that that's a problem for some time. And I just, but we all seem to keep spinning wheels too. Like, I don't, I don't know why no one is trying to make any changes and we're all now feeling the strain of it with um, not only not a lot of help to be, but experienced help is like basically not at least where I am, um, which is 
frustrating. And but I, I, I can't blame people We're not giving them incentive to stay and continue their education in, in their career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's this is a yeah, it's it's a tough one. And well, we I could probably we could probably go on for hours. Yes, to yes. Be re <laughs> respectful for everybody's time. Um, if if anybody has any thoughts or questions before we go, feel free to um, unmute yourself or raise your hand and then unmute yourself. And but um, or email IVA info at IVAPM.org and we can get your questions answered or your comments or your thoughts, because this is not this this session, I think, is a wonderful session because it it generates a lot of food for thought. And together, maybe we should we should do this quarterly and come up with um, some really great um, solutions. Or this is what we did at our practice after we heard you talk, kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. That would be that would be wonderful to hear yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So um, thank you everyone um, for joining and thanks to those that are joining on Facebook and thank you very much Anne and Gwen for tackling these tough subjects. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Thank. thanks Jen, I, I loved it. I love doing this, so. Yeah, so um, everybody's on saying thank you, thank you, thank you in the chat. Um, a, a really, really wonderful to um, have everybody and sharing this and sharing your thoughts and reach out to us and together we'll get positive change, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yes, 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 yes. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.